This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play the Hannibal portion of Hannibal and Hamilcar. Hannibal and Hamilcar was released in 2018 by Phalanx and designed by Mark Semenich and Yaro Andruskovich. This game supports two players and takes anywhere from 1 to 8 hours to play depending on the scenario you've chosen. This is the fourth and final episode for the Hannibal portion of the Hannibal and Hamilcar tutorial series. In the first episode, we learned an overview of the game and set it up. The second episode covered the phases of gameplay. The third episode covered movement, and this final episode covers all aspects of combat. Combat is one of the most interesting aspects of Hannibal, so let's jump right in. Sieges and subjugation are multi-turn military engagements meant to break down the fortitude of a walled city's inhabitants or the will of a hostile tribe with the ultimate goal of conquering and converting that space to the attacker's side. Rome and Carthage have different skill sets with each type of warfare. This is represented by the new version's custom siege die. The white siege die represents less skill and the red siege die indicates greater skill. For subjugation, both sides have equal skill and greater experience and therefore use the red siege die. When conducting a siege on a normal walled city, there are differences. Rome has greater experiences with siege at this scale and uses the red siege die. Carthage has less skill with sieges overall and uses the white siege die. Siege skills can be augmented with the proper component or card play. If the player for Rome uses their siege expert General Marcellus with a campaign strategy card, then they can use the cross sword die result to increase their siege skill. If Carthage deploys their siege tower, they can upgrade to a red siege die. Large walled cities are much more difficult to siege and both sides use the white siege die. When the Roman general uses Marcellus with a campaign card, they can upgrade to the red siege die. The Carthaginian siege tower can nullify a unique defense of Roman large walled cities, the tower. Now let's look at each of these situations in greater detail. Although a siege and a subjugation uses similar mechanics, subjugations are much more straightforward, so let's look at subjugating a tribe first. At a minimum, to begin the subjugation of a tribe, a player needs a general with at least three combat units in the same space as the tribe. To successfully complete a tribal subjugation requires three siege points. As you'll see, this may take several strategy card plays to complete. Next, the player attempting to subjugate the hostile tribe will take the red siege die. Previous versions of Hannibal used a table for sieges and subjugations. This new version has implemented custom dice with special symbols that accomplish the same results as the classic table. For subjugations, players only need to focus on two symbols that appear as results on the red die. A triangle signals success in the subjugation and means that the player can place one siege point marker next to the hostile tribe marker. These results are cumulative, so two triangles would mean two siege point markers. A bullseye means that one of the attacker's combat units is eliminated. Throughout the siege or subjugation, the attacking force is subject to taking casualties. If this reduces the attacking general's forces below three combat units, the siege or subjugation cannot be continued until the army is reinforced back to at least three combat units. This reduction also does not end the siege or subjugation or remove any siege points. A siege only ends under two conditions. All enemy forces are eliminated from the space, or the attacking army disengages and vacates all forces from the space. When this happens, the siege or subjugation ends and all siege points are removed. The cross sword symbol is only for conducting sieges. Therefore, during a subjugation, this symbol can be ignored. Once a player has scored three siege points, the tribe is considered subjugated. 
remove the hostile tribe marker and replace it with a political control marker. A subjugation attempt may take several strategy card plays to complete. Next, let's discuss sieges against walled cities. Walled cities come in two varieties, normal walled cities and large walled cities. When conducting a siege against a walled city, most of the rules from subjugation are mirrored here. One of the differences between subjugations and sieges is the use of custom die. When conducting a siege on a normal walled city, the Carthage player uses the white siege die and the Roman player uses the red siege die. The difference between the dice is that Rome has more experience conducting sieges than Carthage. This is reflected by their die providing an overall greater result. Each custom siege die has a unique symbol, the tower on the white siege die and the cross swords on the red siege die. These are priority effects that supersede the printed symbols when certain conditions are met. We will discuss the tower symbol and its full implications on gameplay in just a moment. While discussing normal walled cities, let's discuss the cross swords. The cross sword symbol is used when the Roman general Marcellus is conducting the siege. Marcellus is a master of sieges and when this general is used along with a campaign card, his special ability upgrades the red siege die face with the swords to a double triangle which awards two siege points. So keep this general in mind when playing as Rome. Also, walled cities and large walled cities have different attributes. Let's pause for a moment and learn more about these differences. Large walled cities differ from normal walled cities in a couple of ways. The number of units that can take refuge inside a walled city has a different capacity depending on the type. Normal walled cities can shelter two combat units. The large walled city of Syracuse can also shelter two combat units. And the large walled cities of Rome and Carthage can shelter five combat units each. As a quick note, generals do not count against these capacity numbers. Next, large walled cities have stronger defenses that manifest themselves in two ways. First, large walled cities force both sides to use the white siege die. With large walled cities, the Rome player essentially loses their siege advantage granted by the red die. There is, however, an exception. The Roman general Marcellus is a siege expert and when leading a siege with a campaign card, can use the red siege die against large walled cities. More on that in just a moment. Also, a large walled city may have a white tower defense symbol. This is a unique defense measure of Roman controlled large walled cities that can inflict additional casualties on sieging Carthaginians. Now let's head back to our siege example and see how this works. Now let's look at an example of Carthage besieging the large walled city of Rome and learn how Roman defense towers work. On one side of the white siege die is the tower symbol. This is a reference to the unique tower defense in Roman large walled cities. If the Carthaginian player rolls this die when conducting a siege on a large walled city with a tower, then they suffer a loss of one combat unit. However, this defense can be mitigated by playing strategy card number 30 and deploying a Carthaginian siege train. The siege train nullifies a large walled city's tower. This converts that side of the white siege die to just earning one siege point. Once deployed, the siege train becomes attached to the chosen army and can be used for multiple sieges. Also, if the city being besieged does not have a tower, then the player can upgrade their force to using the red siege die. Now, let's talk about sorties. If a player sends another army to attack an enemy force conducting a siege against their city, they may also count the combat units taking shelter within the walled city as part of the overall forces. When besieged combat units are added to an attack or a besieged army attacks on its own, it's called a sortie. Also when this occurs, land battle losses come from either the relief army or the combat units inside that sortie at the controlling player's discretion. If there is a general inside the city when a sortie occurs and that general is the same rank as the commanding general of the relief army, 
the player may choose the commanding general of all forces in the same space. Otherwise, the commander with the highest rank is considered in command. If no sortie occurs, the general inside the walled city cannot be used. Also note that only the combat units and generals in that sortie may retreat back into the safety of the walled city. A quick note, although combat units taking refuge in a walled city can conduct sorties and move in and out of the city, they cannot leave the location until the siege is lifted. This includes naval movement in and out of the city. Also, the owner of the walled city cannot receive reinforcements at that location while it's under siege. Keep these rules in mind when conducting sieges and subjugations during your games. Before we move on to combat, let's learn how to use the classic tables for sieges and subjugations. Hannibal and Hamilcar comes with a reference sheet that includes all the classic tables from previous versions of the game. For sieges and subjugations, the classic six-sided die is used with the siege table. The siege table is laid out as follows. The first column indicates the die result. The second column corresponds to any siege points earned, and the third column any combat units eliminated. Below the table is a bulleted list of modifiers to adjust the die result based on situations on the game board. Carthage receives a negative one to the die result for their lack of experience with sieges. Carthage also receives a plus one for using a siege train. Both sides may receive a penalty of negative one for besieging large walled cities. And finally, a plus one for Rome if using Marcellus with a campaign card. Keep these classic tables in mind when playing Hannibal with someone who prefers this method of resolving sieges. The combat sequence in Hannibal can be organized into four stages. In the engagement phase, the active player's general attempts to engage his enemy in combat. His opponent can attempt to avoid battle, and he can attempt to pursue them. Once the active general has successfully engaged his opponent in combat, the pre-battle sequence begins. In this stage, players organize for battle. Carthage may roll to see if there's a Roman consul rotation, each player gathers their battle cards. If Carthage has elephants in the battle, they may conduct a battle charge. Also, each side may play strategy card counters during this stage. Next, the battle kicks into high gear, with each side playing and matching battle cards, counterattacking, and if necessary, looking for an opportunity to withdraw. The final stage is the aftermath of the battle. In this stage, whether victor, vanquished, or just vanished, each side calculates casualties. Retreats are conducted, and the outcome may have political marker ramifications. Now, as always, let's look at each of these stages in greater detail. Land battles occur when a player moves their general and his forces into a space containing the enemy exceeding one combat unit. One combat unit or a lone general in the space may result in an overrun and the unit being eliminated or displaced. The enemy general, alone or with up to 10 combat units, may attempt to avoid the battle. To avoid a battle, the non-active player must roll a classic die and receive a result equal to or less than their general's battle rating. If the enemy general fails their die roll, they must remain in the space and conduct combat. Also, the non-active player's general loses one battle card as a penalty. If the non-active player makes a successful die roll, then they can leave the space. A common tactic to stop pursuit is if the non-active player leaves two combat units from their forces behind. This will force the active player's general into combat when they enter the space and allow the enemy general and their remaining forces to escape. Successfully avoiding a battle has limitations on movement. The avoiding general and his forces can only move to an empty or friendly space. The active player's general who entered that space must also roll a classic die against their battle rating. If they fail that roll, they remain in the space and their movement ends. If they succeed in their roll and they have movement points remaining, they may choose to pursue the general or continue moving along their original route. 
When the active general pursues the fleeing general to a new space, that general has the opportunity to try to avoid battle again. Likewise, the active general will also need to roll against their battle rating once more to see if they stop in the space or are eligible to pursue. This cycle will continue and only end if the avoiding general fails their roll, runs out of movement points, or the enemy is finally forced into combat. And once that game of cat and mouse is over, a battle may occur, which we will cover next. In the pre-battle sequence, players prepare their forces for the main battle. Let's walk through each activity that may occur during this phase. First, if Rome is in a battle with two consuls, the Carthaginian player may roll to see if there is a general rotation. This strategy may replace a stronger general with a weaker general. The key activity of this phase is for each player to draw their hand of battle cards. The battle card deck is comprised of 42 cards. These cards are organized into six types based on a combat maneuver. There are nine flank lefts, 12 frontal assaults, nine flank rights, eight probes, six double envelopments, and four reserve cards. We will cover off on the significance of these different cards in just a moment. Next, we will look at the opportunities and penalties for drawing battle cards to form a player's personal deck. The number of battle cards a player can draw for their opening hand are based on several factors. Battle card opportunities or penalties are divided into three groups. Opportunities based on a player's army, opportunities or penalties for maneuvers, and finally, opportunities from provincial allies. First, a player draws a number of battle cards equal to their general's battle rating. Remember, this is only for the general leading the army. Any subordinate generals do not add to this total. Next, a player draws a battle card for each combat unit in their army involved in the battle. After that, if the battle was the result of a successful interception by the non-active player, then they add one battle card. Following this, if the player failed an avoid battle roll, remove one battle card. Also, each side may play counter cards that add or remove battle cards during this phase. We will discuss these cards in greater detail in just a moment. If the space contains a friendly tribe to the Carthaginian player, add one battle card. If the battle is taking place in Latium, essentially Rome, add two battle cards to the Roman side. These two battle cards are associated with the militia stationed in Rome and are not to be confused with provincial allies. Finally, players will calculate their provincial allies and add battle cards. To calculate this, refer to the political control track. The player is awarded battle cards for the region the battle takes place in. For example, if the battle takes place in Africa, then a player could earn two battle cards for Numidia Minor, two cards for Numidia Major, one card for Libya, and one card for Carthage. Whichever player controls those provinces earns those battle cards. Let's look at another region, this time Italy. The rules for provincial allies in Italy are a little more complex. In Italy, the Rome player can only receive a maximum of two battle cards for controlling provinces. However, for Carthage, they can receive one battle card for each province in Italy they control. These rules balance out gameplay for both sides. Therefore, when conducting battles in Italy, be aware that Rome can only receive two battle cards and Carthage has more flexibility. As you can see, battles fought on islands like Corsica and Sardinia or Sicily have limited provinces to control, therefore less battle cards from allies. Once you've worked your way through this checklist of opportunities and penalties, total these numbers to come up with each player's starting number of battle cards. Keep in mind though, these starting battle cards can still be reduced by special counters and player actions as we will see next. During this time, players should also review their hand of strategy cards to see if they have any effective counters. Counter cards are strategy cards with a purple border and cross swords icon. Many of these counter cards can be played during the pre-battle phase. Counters often add or remove battle cards from a player's hand. 
Battle cards like Maharbal's Cavalry can only be played during the battle. One of the highlights of this phase is if Carthage has elephants in play. The Carthage player may have up to four elephant combat units in the game. If an elephant combat unit is engaged in a battle, after the battle card draw and before Rome looks at their cards, the Carthage player can announce an elephant charge. For this to be successful, the Carthage player must roll a classic die and score a result greater than the Roman general's battle rating. If the die roll is successful, reduce a random battle card for each elephant in the charge. Be aware that elephant charges don't come without an element of risk. If the player for Carthage rolls a 1, then the elephants rampage, Rome is unaffected, and Carthage loses one battle card. However, the player for Rome does have a possible defense against elephants. Before Carthage can roll the die for their elephant charge, Rome can play a counter card for elephant fright. Then the elephants charging turn back and disrupt Carthage's army. The player for Carthage suffers a loss of two random battle cards because of this. Keep these rules in mind if the Carthage player has elephants in the battle. For Hannibal's combat mechanics, it's important to understand the connotations of the terms attacker and defender. In the rules, the term attacker means the player who started the battle, and the term defender means the player who got brought into it. However, it also means the ever-changing combat posture of each player as the battle progresses. A player can be an attacker in one round of the battle, be beaten back into a defender position in the next, Therefore, to differentiate the two, I'm going to refer this as attack posture and defense posture. In our example, the Roman player on the left is the attacker. They initiated the battle. Currently, they are in an attack posture. The player for Carthage on the right is the defender. They were brought into the battle by Rome attacking. They are currently in a defense posture. Now let's work our way through the flow of battle. Now that the pre-battle sequence is complete, both players square off with their battle cards. The player in the attack posture plays the first battle card. As we saw earlier, each battle card has a maneuver type, and there is only a specific number of each type in the deck. The objective is for the player in the attack posture to place a card that cannot be matched by the player in the defense posture. For this simple example, let's say that the Rome player puts down a frontal assault battle card as their attack. Next, the player in the defense posture must search through their hand of cards and find a matching card to put down. If they cannot match the played card, then they lose the battle. Even if they have a matching card, they also have the option to decline playing it and purposely lose the battle. If seriously outmatched, this can give them an opportunity to escape. For this example, let's say the player in the defense posture plays the matching frontal assault battle card. Now that they've matched the card, they've successfully survived the first round of battle. Now that the first battle round is complete, each side should place their used battle cards in a pile beside them. It will be necessary later to count the number of battle rounds to determine casualties for each side. Now the player on the defensive has a choice to make. They can continue the battle in a defense posture or counterattack and try to shift into an attack posture. Assuming the defense posture is not always a bad position. If the attacker has less battle cards than defender, then it may be wise to let them spend all their battle cards and be defeated. However, for this example, let's look at the counterattack. To successfully counterattack and change posture, the player must make a classic die roll with a result equal to or less than their general's battle rating. If they successfully counterattack, they assume the attack posture, and the other player is now on the defensive. However, if they fail the roll, they continue for another battle round in the defense posture. Once players assume their new postures, or remain in the old ones, it's time to start another round of battle. Now let's discuss one additional option for the attacker. The player in the attack position may also opt to withdraw from the battle. To accomplish this, the attacking player must roll a classic die with a result equal to or less than their general's battle rating. 
The player in the defensive position can prevent this withdrawal by rolling a result equal to or less than their general's battle rating. If they succeed, they seize the initiative, become the attacker, and force their opponent into a defensive posture to play through a round of combat. If the player trying to prevent the withdrawal fails, the attacking general can successfully withdraw. A withdrawing general retraces their path back to the last space before they initiated the battle. The withdrawing general is still required to calculate their battle casualties. We will cover off how that works in just a moment. Now let's discuss some battle cards that can be played for additional effects in the game. If the attacker plays a double envelopment battle card and the player on the defense matches it, they can take the initiative and may assume the attack posture for the next battle. The double envelopment battle card is rare and there are only six of them in the deck. However, the player on the defense can play a reserve battle card as well. A reserve battle card acts as a wild card and can match any battle card type in the game. Keep these special abilities in mind when playing battle cards. As you can see from the diagram below, all of these actions in the battle form a continuous loop. Players will continue to cycle through battle rounds until one player does not have a card to play or does not want to play a card and the battle ends. From this point, it's time to proceed to the aftermath. In the aftermath of the battle, it's necessary to determine casualties for both sides, then resolve the fate of the retreating army, and finally calculate the political ramifications of the battle. In the first step, both sides determine casualties incurred by the battle. Players calculate battle casualties by each rolling a classic die and plotting the result on the attrition table. The column to use on the attrition table is determined by the player who played the most battle cards. This is why players should keep their played cards in a pile beside them so they can count them for this outcome. Next, the retreating player then needs to roll a retreat die to determine the casualties incurred leaving the battlefield. This new version of Hannibal comes with two custom retreat die. The smaller retreat die is for retreating army containing one to four combat units. And the larger die is for retreating armies of five or more combat units. Each symbol on the die result is matched to the text at the bottom of the last combat card played. The text on the card will tell you which symbols to count for casualties. For example, this Frontal Assault Combat card instructs the player to remove combat units for each sword, horse, or bullseye symbol on the die result. For a Carthaginian retreat, elephants must always be chosen as the first casualties. Finally, the defeated army is in full retreat and can move up to four spaces to find a safe location. The retreating army must now trace a path to a friendly space that is clear of enemy combat units or to a space that contains more friendly combat units than enemy combat units. If there are multiple options, the player must take the shortest path. Combat units or generals cannot be left behind, and lone friendly combat units encountered along the way are swept up into the retreat. The retreating army can suffer more casualties on their path to safety. If the retreating army crosses a space with an enemy political control marker, then they lose one combat unit. If they cross a space with enemy combat units, they lose a combat unit for every enemy combat unit. If they cannot find a safe haven within four spaces, then the retreating army is eliminated. An army's defeat has greater ramifications for the political aspect of the game. The total casualties in each of these steps for the defeated army is then divided in half, and that quotient is the number of political markers that player needs to remove from the game board. Before we close out this episode, let's look at the classic table for retreats. Once again, there is an insert that comes with Hannibal and Hamilcar that includes all the classic tables from previous versions of the game. The retreat table is located on the right side of this sheet. The first column on the table is for the die result. The second column is if the retreating army has one to four combat units, and the third column is for a retreating army with five or more combat units. 
This table also has seven rows to accommodate battle card die modifiers. These modifiers are listed below the table. If the last card played was a probe card, subtract two from the die result. If the last card played was a double envelopment, add two to the die result. Therefore, calculating the casualties from a retreat is very simple with this table. Keep these classic tables in mind if you encounter a player who prefers this method over using the new retreat dice. Now, at this point, after four tutorials, you should be prepared to begin your own game of Hannibal. So go ahead and give Hannibal a go, because in the next episode, we're going to be looking at Hamilcar. This concludes the Hannibal portion from the Hannibal and Hamilcar board game by Phalanx. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will begin to learn to play Hamilcar. Hamilcar is set during the First Punic War and focuses on Hannibal's father. If you like this content and would like to see more, be sure to hit the like button and then ring the bell for notifications. As always, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.